Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. We're here broadcasting live from our homes around Washington, D.C. region, and we'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather today, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. I'm Tanya Thrasher, NMAI Publications Manager, and again, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to present today's program titled Making a Memorial, a conversation about the book Why We Serve, Native Americans in the United States Armed Forces. I'm especially pleased because we have my colleagues, NMAI Senior Editor and Writer Alexandra Harris and NMAI Historian Mark Hirsch joining us to discuss the book, which chronicles individual stories and the experience of Native peoples in the military. Why We Serve was released about a week ago on September 15th, and we hope you will explore that book and the accompanying online exhibition, which will go live in early November. And now it's my pleasure to turn the conversation over to my esteemed colleagues, Alexandra and Mark. And it's so good to see you. Hello to you both. Good right. afternoon, Tanya. Hi. First, I'd like to ask you to tell us briefly about your roles here at the museum, and if you wouldn't mind, comment on the significance of this book to you personally. And Alex, if we could start with you. Thanks, Tanya. I'm really excited to be here talking about the book today. Um, uh, as Tanya said, I'm a senior writer and editor at the museum, and uh, I wore many hats in this project, uh, basically project managing at the same time as writing, researching, coordinating guest contributors, um, and photography research, that sort of thing. And for me personally, um, I, I've, I have a lot of family in the military, and they have served us in every conflict, at least as far back as the Civil War. And I keep thinking about their stories, and it's one of the reasons that bringing out personal stories in this publication was really important to me. Thank you. And Mark, would you like to share a little bit? Sure. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm very excited about this uh, conversation. Uh, my role in this project was essentially to uh, work uh, as the one of the two historians who were working on this project. So that my role, I think, is to try to uh, figure out what changes over time. That's what historians do. Historians look to see patterns, they look to see continuities, they look to discover discontinuities. And that's what we really tried to do in this book, and that's what I tried to, to bring to the book as an historian. And I think um, we, we tried to, to look at two things here. One of them was uh, essentially, how do we explain this, what I call an invisible fact? That is how this, this large number of Native people who have served in the military, the American Armed Forces, since the American Revolution through the present. And then the second question being, why? Why did all those people serve? And those are the twin pillars, I guess, that this book sits on. Great. Thank you both. And you um, both tapped into the content a little bit. But before we continue discussing the content and examples of that, I wanted to sort of start our conversation on the topic of process, if you wouldn't mind, um, how you co-authored a book like this. And as part of that process, how did you both bring your individual interests and your individual experience to this work? And Mark, if we could start with you, that would be great. Sure. Um, Alex and I have, you know, worked at the museum for, for quite a while and we've worked on, on projects before and I think we've figured out a, a, a nice way of working together. And I think we went with our individual interests and said, you know, I, I'd, or I, I would say I went and said, I'd, I'd really like to sort of study the read up and write about the, the Vietnam War, for example. Um, that's something I, I lived through as a very young man, and I remember a lot of the politics around it, but learning something about the Native experience of that war for me was, I think, going to be a really, really exciting possibility. And um, so that's what I, I did, and we sort of sat down and did a little, I guess you could say a little bit of horse trading. I took some things that uh, I thought I was interested in, um, and Alex identified some things she was uh, interested in, and it all worked out rather well, I think, in the end. Great, thank you. And Alex, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, as Mark said, we've had a great partnership for many years at the museum on several projects. 
And it was, you know, I think it was kismet in a way that our goals for this project aligned, um, bringing seldom told stories to light, putting native people in their own words at the forefront. Um, we've, we tried to do sort of overviews of different eras, but then using photographs to tell deeper stories uh, in more detail and place women at all eras of history. That was a real um, a goal of mine. I wanted women in this story um, throughout this history. And, um, and I think it was really important to talk about, uh, for me, to talk about issues that hadn't been addressed in other histories. Can we talk about the, uh, not just war, but diplomacy and peace and those traditions? Can we talk about uh, how native customs are surrounding war have continued from the colonial era through every single era of war till the modern era? So all of those we teased out and we had a wonderful time speaking with people about this, their own experiences in history. Great. Well, it's been really, really interesting for me to watch this process. And along the way, you've impressed upon me the central question of this book, which is why do Native Americans serve in the United States military? And so what did you find to be the answer of that question? Or is there a singular answer at all to that question? And um, Alex, if you'd like to comment first. Sure. And I, I, I think uh, our, the title of our book is a bit of a teaser. It, it, there's no single answer. Um, and I think what, what we hope we have established, um, or at least told in some detail, is the diversity of approaches that every single individual who joins the military joins for their own reasons. Mm -hmm. And whether that's um, the same as any other American who joins the military, so it could be for education, to travel, it could be to have three meals and a bed to sleep in. But there's, on top of that, there can be very indigenous reasons for service, whether that's a family history, a family tradition or community tradition. Um, there, there's a wonderful spectrum of, of approaches. Great, thank you. And Mark, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with Alex. I mean, I think it became very clear to us as we began to do research on the book that we could not come up with one large overarching reason why Native people have, have joined the military in the ways that they have done since the American Revolution through the present. Um, apart from anything else, to do so is, is to essentially stereotype Native people and stereotype the sort of the, the, the behavior of Native people in ways that uh, really pervert uh, what really happens and perverts uh, Native American history. And we we were dead set against that. Uh, Native people have been stereotyped quite enough, thank you. And um, so, uh, although I think people have felt that we have come up with more of a complex set of reasons, um, rather than one single one that people can hold on to. I think it's it's uh, much, much clo closer to the real experience of real people. Um, and I feel very, very, very confident that that's, um, that that's a really good thing, that people know that. Um, and the question itself is really important. You know, why do Native people serve? If you know anything about the history of Native people in the United States, if you know anything about the relationship between the United States government and Native people over 100, 200, 250 years, you know that that is a very fraught relationship. And so it raises the question, why? Why did all these people serve? And that's 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 really the question, as I say, that underpins underpins the book, and um, is it the reason why we really needed to come up with um, an explanation that didn't sit in one box? It sits in many boxes um, because there are so many reasons to account for, and so many individuals to account for as well. Great. Thank you both. I really appreciate these really thoughtful answers, and um, it's always 
of course, a privilege to work with you both, but especially on this project, um, from my vantage point, it's been really exciting to watch you to ha having these um, conversations with scholars and the book contributors and to see these exchanges that led you down the new paths of research that you both talked about. You've truly advanced the scholarship on this topic and it's been really impressive to watch. Um, so I wanted to know what are some examples um, about, you know, of these stories or these new facts that you've been mentioning that are brought to light, maybe some that you didn't expect to find or were surprising. So Mark, if you'd like to comment on something surprising or unusual that you found. I, I guess this, is, this comes under the, um, the rubric of kind of a confession. <laughs> um, I, I would say I went into this thinking that um, there were, you know, many reasons, of course, that the Native people uh, joined the military. Uh, but as somebody who I think has a certain kind of sympathy for um, tribal sovereignty and the the effort to to uh, to operationalize tribal sovereignty, I, I, I went in thinking that many Native people joined the service uh, to protect tribal lands, uh, to protect their lands against against enemies. Um, and I went in with a kind of blinder that, that said that that's, that's why, that's got to be the most important reason. And in talking to different people, including one of the uh, uh, veterans I, I, I interviewed, it, I had a, had a moment of reckoning where I, I, it, it was very clear to me that she had served in Iraq. Um, and I, I said, well, what, why did you, you're, you know, as a woman, why did you want to join the military? She said, well, you know, I have this remarkable family tradition, and she did, of people joining the military, uncles, aunts, our grandmother even. Um, but she said, you know, that's not the reason why I joined. And I, I was getting ready for the, uh, the explanation. You know, I joined because I wanted to um, uh, protect tribal lands. Well, as it turned out in her case, she had to join the military or felt she needed to join the military at that time because she was facing a really abusive relationship in a very abusive relationship and needed to get out. And it was a moment of reckoning for, for me that th this, this person had lots of reasons to, to join the military, but the, 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 the important one for her is that in order to survive, she had to join the, the military and, and, you know, that, that was a very feelingful moment for me um, and, and memorable. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. Alex, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, I, I think for me, there was, uh, I'll say this, it's very challenging to do a publication like this where you're surveying 250 years of history. We did some original research, but we also dug into the expertise of many, many, many scholars. And one of the benefits of being able to survey is to also read between the lines. And at one point, I remember calling up Mark and saying, are you seeing what I'm seeing here? And you can identify patterns. And for me, um, and a personal interest, and, and I guess also pet peeve, is the emergence of stereotypes and sometimes positive stereotypes, whether, um, for example, uh, the idea of the warrior tradition, which absolutely exists um, in many tribes, but doesn't for others. There are some tribes with a distinctly pacifist um, uh, culture that they still adhere to. And I, I wanted that diversity of of how people um, relate in their own cultures with the military, with um, war, to emerge in a more complex way. To really break apart this idea that, or this myth that Native people have some supernatural proclivity towards military service. Um, it's a, it's a, a stereotype that ends up harming Native people um, in, in myriad ways within the military and their service. They get put in more dangerous assignments. We, we talk a, a lot about that in the book. But that was a real surprise to me to, to be able, and, and actually sort of a, um, a guilty pleasure almost, to tease out this stereotype and try to break it up. 
Thank you both very much. Um, I wanted to continue with you, Alex, if you don't mind, because I know uh, in the past few years of creating this book, you've commented on um, examples of women in service. I wondered if you could comment on that a little bit. Sure. Uh, it was really important for me to, you know, like I said, the diversity of Native service. So trying to bring in uh, stories from, uh, from nations throughout you know, what the, the borders of the United States represent from Hawaii to Alaska to, to the East Coast. And within that history, I wanted women to, and, you know, we, we need to represent all the genders that emerge as well. And one of the, the earliest stories we tell is of some female Wampanoag leaders in, um, in what's now Massachusetts, um, Rhode Island, that area. And I'm leaning hard on some research that has already been done in an incredible book. Um, um, but, it, it, and I hope we did justice to it, but what, what the crux of it is, is that women were leaders in colonial times before Europeans arrived here. And there was no separation between military service and governance or your role in your community. This was for the defense of your community. So for, to me, female leaders who are sending their nation's warriors out to fight or defend are military leaders as well. And I think that story needs to come to light um, because I, it really hasn't been one that's been explored up till now. Great, thank you. I really appreciate that example. And Mark, um, I just had a quick question for you too. Um, I wanted to just remind the audience that as they may know, the museum hosted many consultation events around the country um, as part of the process of creating and designing the National Native American Veterans Memorial. Did these conversations ever inform your work? I recall you talking about that, Mark, a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. Um, in preparation for um, the development of the, the uh, National Native American Veterans Memorial, the um, National Museum of the American Indian did a number, quite a number of uh, consultations, um, roughly 35 consultations um, in something like 16 states with around 1,200 people um, to not only talk about, you know, what the memorial should look like, that was obviously a big, big issue, um, and, and what, should, what it should mean, what its design should look like, um, but what the um, experience of war was about for Native people. And in the course of those discussions, which were taped um, and transcribed, um, we, Alex and I, had access to a veritable treasure trove of first-person uh, Native American comment about um, what the what their experience of war was um, for many of these veterans um, going back, I would say mainly these were post um, Korea veterans. Uh, vet, sorry, I should say uh, Korea veterans and after. Um, but still, that was that left a lot of people who had served in various branches of the military, and we had access to these wonderful uh, recordings, which again, made it very, very clear that we could not stereotype Native people. We could not stereotype this, the, the, the reasons for this service. It varied enormously, but the fact of the service was there. The fact of patriotism uh, and its complexity, uh, both the patriotism toward the United States and the patriotism reflected, um, uh, representing tribal, uh, nations is there. Um, and so those words were really telling and really important for us. And I think they really helped shape our, our thinking about um, both the questions we were asking and the kind of answers we were um, developing in the book. Great. Thank you both. I really appreciate your conversation and the thoughtful answers. Um, I personally can't wait to get my hands on the book and share it with my family and especially my father, who's a proud career army veteran from Cherokee Nation. And I, I find that the stories that you both have brought together with contributing scholars truly resonate with um, any readers, any, any background that you may have or experience. Um, there's a lot of universal connections throughout the book. And 
on behalf of both um, Mark and Alex and myself. For those of you in the audience who have served, we want to say thank you. And for those of you who have family members who have served or perhaps are on active duty, or if you've cared for those in military service, we thank you. Now I'd like to turn the program to our audience to ask any questions that they have of you, Alex and Mark. So now I'm going to check our live Q&A chat feature for any questions. And we have a question here from an audience member. Were American Indians subject to the World War I draft, even though many did not enjoy US citizen status? So either Mark or Alex, would you care to comment? Um, my understanding is that, that uh, some were absolutely subject to the draft. Um, about two thirds of native people um, were, were citizens uh, already by, uh, by World War I. And I think um, most people don't know that really. Most people think that all native people were um, granted citizenship in the United States only in 1924. Um, but no, that's, that's not quite right. Um, and uh, those that were citizens were um, subject to, to the draft and so far as I understand it. Thank you. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but I seem to recall that uh, a good number of Native people wanted to join even though they weren't citizens um, and that the draft boards had to create a special dispensation for non-citizen Indians to, to participate in World War I. I think that's right, Alex. Um, you know, it's what's very clear is that there is a massive turnout of Native people during World War I. And, um, the, you know, that's, that's very, very, very clear. And the reasons, again, always complicated. Uh, but it seems that in some cases, Native people, very much like the rest of the world and the, and the, United, the United States, certainly really understood and took to heart um, that this was a war um, for democracy. And a lot of uh, President Wilson's ideas about bringing democracy to the world were, um, had a really interesting impact, I think, on Native people who knew because of the relationship between Native people and the, uh, the Indian Bureau that um, they did not live um, under de in a democratic republic in quite the way that other Americans did. And so a, a war to, uh, to bring democracy to the world had a kind of a special resonance to a lot of these Native soldiers. And they really felt like that's what we're going to have after we serve um, in World War I. They didn't get it, but they would get it over time. And that's, that's one of the important lessons, I think, of the book. Great. Thank you both. That's an excellent, excellent question. OK. And could either of you or both of you share more information about how you chose the photos in the book, how you made selections for the images? Sure, I, I think there was a large spectrum and I owe a lot of this to our colleague who worked on photo acquisition and permissions with us. We couldn't have done this without her. You know, with our goal of, of this, um, this book being very people forward, we knew we needed a lot of images and we wanted to show images that hadn't or at least had rarely been shown before. So some, some we pulled, um, you know, we, we sourced from other publications, but we wanted to dig deeper. For example, uh, we wanted images of code talkers that hadn't been used commonly. So, um, so we worked with uh, uh, historical societies and such to find like the Mishkwaki code talkers of World War II. Um, it was really important, again, even in code talking to represent the diversity of languages there. Right. And Mark? I, I guess I would just agree with Alex. Occasionally, you know, I'd come across something that maybe she hadn't seen before. You know, that's a fairly rare case. I think Alex had, had the uh, terrain pretty well covered. Um, there was, I think, one, I guess you, this, this falls under the category of special pleading. There was a wonderful photo of uh, the liberation of one of the concentration camps in 1945, and um, Native uh, American soldiers were part of the unit um, that liberated um, that camp. And I felt it really was important to have that in, in, a, in, in the book. Um, it meant a lot to me, I think. 
-hmm. personally given my background, but also because um, I, I don't think many people had seen that photo before. And Alex, um, Alex agreed, and so it, um, it is indeed in our book. Great, thank you both. And we have time for one more question. And all right, have you found that the reason to join or serve in the military differs from generation to generation? Example, my grandfather joined to represent and felt it was duty to stand up. My father was drafted and I joined as a way to get away from the reservation. Have you found this? Question. This differs among generations? Question. Mm, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I think it goes back to what we said early in the conversation that it, it it really depends. Every individual has to choose their own way. And a lot of that pressure does come from family and community. I remember talking to a veteran of the Gulf War and he told me that he, he joined um, because, and I, I hope I'm remembering this correctly. So he, he had gotten his acceptance letter from college and the same day his grandmother invited him over and had him look at her photo wall and she says everyone on this wall has joined the military except you that's a lot of pressure so i think everyone is you know your family is going to tell their own stories of why they they joined and that um, sometimes it's trauma sometimes it's um patriotism and um and you know patriotism to your own people uh, uh tribal nation uh it, it's a it's really complicated yeah i get it yeah I, I agree with alex i mean i think i think it's um it, it, there's a lot of factors involved over time um i would say the, the only caveat i guess is, and it's a small one is is that in the 20th century you do see sort of different reasons emerging i think over over time Hmm. So that in in World War One, you do you do see some people um, joining because they feel um, it's it's really important to show that Native people can be citizens of the United States, um, uh, you know, which many white people, Native uh, Native Amer sorry, uh, non-Native people did not believe. They felt that you you absolutely you know Native people were not Americans. Um, but I think over time, what you, what you see is a development in the in, in certainly by World War II and after is is a kind of a generational difference in which there's an understanding, a kind of a, a dual consciousness almost that that we can be Americans, we can be citizens in the United States, but we could also be citizens of tribal nations, um, and I think that that that's a big difference, and I think that's uh, uh, something that happened in the in the twentieth century um, that can't really be read back in time easily. Um, uh, so that's something we, I think, as historians, have to be very careful for not to sort of read back the present into the past. Mm -hmm. So I, I, ho I hope that answers your your question. It's, it's uh, like everything else in this subject; it's it's um, complex, and there's no one easy answer. So true. So true. And I know we're closing, Tanya and Mark, but I did see one question breeze by, and I feel really obligated to thank our guest contributors to the book. Because when Mark and I created this book, we knew that there was pockets of information and history that we just had no resources for. Native Hawaiian Service is right. one of them, the Alaska Territorial Guard. And those stories are so critical and so untold. So we brought in um, experts in, in, in their home, uh, you know, Paul Ongtukuk, who wrote about the Alaska Territorial Guard and Dr. T Kavika Tengen, um, uh, who, from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, who wrote about um, Native Hawaiian response to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And we, this book is so much better off with those voices. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. I join you in thanking the contributors as well. Um, we, we truly appreciate these thoughtful questions. And as you mentioned, many went by. So we do promise to collect them and we're going to put them in the link with the posting of the YouTube recording of today's chat. And although I could talk to Alex and Mark a lot, a lot longer, unfortunately we have to wrap it up for today. And we're truly grateful 
for Alex and Mark, you joining us today and for our audience. You've been truly engaged and we appreciate that very much. Thank and you. Thank you so much. Of course. All right, we do hope that you have a chance to check out the book or visit our museum website for a variety of programs honoring Native veterans. We hope that you have a wonderful day. Please do continue to take care and we hope that you'll join us for future events. Thank you.